This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Seated. Our scriptural text today comes from a single verse in Psalm 73, verse 26. It simply says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, but God. The most important part always follows the but. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And we're talking today from the subject, why we fail. Why we fail. The theme here of Psalm 73 is really about finding confidence to live faithfully in a corrupt and an unfair world where it seems like wicked people prosper and the godly suffer. And it looks like God is inactive. How do we remain faithful to God when it appears as though you're praying and you're trying to serve God and you're, you're giving tithes and then people who have no regard for God become billionaires? And life seems so desperately unfair, but yet God is just. And we wonder, and you see, it's just an appearance because at the end, there is a different reward when you have not reverenced God and invited him to be Lord of your life. And so this is the challenge to the church. That how do we remain faithful to God during times when it looks like people who have no regard for him are doing better than the people of God? And we have to stay devoted. This is one of the Levites by the name of Asaph that penned this particular psalm. He was commissioned by King David uh, to write and commissioned by David to lead all of the singing that was done in the temple as a part of that Levitical, uh, Levitical priesthood. And here we are wondering why, why we fail. It's, uh, it's because we as, as human beings always stand in the need of God's amazing grace. And no matter how great we are, no matter how much we think that we are doing things extremely well, our best efforts in our own human strength and skill and wit and ingenuity, we seem to somehow still come up short. After we've done the best that we could do, somehow there's still room for improvement. We realize we can always do better. I mean, I've met parents to say, you know, if I had to, to do all over again, I would have done this with my children. Had we known better, we would have done better. Uh, we, 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 we come back at the, at the end of things and, and we realize I didn't do as good as I could have done. I could have made that better. We always seem to fail to come up short of what we might consider to be perfection. Even the, the last words on his deathbed of Leonardo da Vinci he simply said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality that it should have. In his brilliance, in his incredibly creative mind, nothing that he did ever measured up to what he felt that he could have done and perhaps should have done. And even if you honestly think that you're all of that on a bag of chips and that you don't ever make mistakes and you don't ever have a need to apologize. Just ask somebody who's close to you because they can see you in your blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. And if you think that you're all of that, well, the world is singing your praise. You have to get people that are close to you in your inner circle. 
Uh, ask your spouse, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your, your neighbor, your co-worker. Ask somebody in your inner circle to show you your flaws. Ask them, uh, do you ever talk too much? Do you ever mess up your grammar? Do you ever do things that you should do? Just ask. If you think that you're all of that, ask somebody who's close enough to be able to see you in your blind spots. See, you can impress people from a distance, but you can only impact them up close. And when you're up close, you get to see things that you cannot see from a distance. There are certain things that if I had wrinkles in my face, you wouldn't be able to see it from a distance. But if somebody zooms in on you, you know, it, it is amazing. I don't realize how much black hair I have in my head until I wet it. And then it makes my black hair stand out. I do have some black hair. It may appear to be great, but that's just an appearance when you get a close look. I show it to my wife when I get it wet. I say, look, look at all that black hair. It's amazing what you can see when you get up close. It's amazing what you can see when you get up close. But I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that even though we are flawed human beings, you know, um, God has a remedy for our flaws and our failures. Thank God we have a remedy. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Thanks be unto God that the person that is designed for you as a life partner, when you really find your soulmate, your soulmate will have a grace to be able to love you and cover you from all of your failures, your sins, your, your mishaps. Uh, the, 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 the Greek word that we have for sin is the word hamartia. It literally means to miss the mark. Like a target uh, is, a, is a bullseye. You're trying to aim for the bullseye. And if you miss it, it's called hamartia. You, you miss the mark. And so many of us in our best effort after taking our best shot, we sometimes miss the mark. And when you miss the mark, thanks be unto God that God has mercy. Mercy is a form of God's unmerited favor his love toward us it is love mercy always comes out of love it comes out of love you never give mercy to people that you don't care anything about you never give mercy to people that you don't care anything about and when we know that we stand in the need of God's mercy when we have come up short that's when you hear people we've had a lady that in my first church that I pastored I would just hear her holler out Lord have mercy because we all realize, my God, we need the mercy of God because we are flawed and we fail. Even when we said that we wouldn't do it again, we end up coming up short, missing the mark. Even when we didn't try to hurt the person, we ended up hurting somebody, ended up offending somebody, ended up doing something that we had not planned on doing, and we need mercy. We need mercy. We need mercy. Tell somebody, Lord, have mercy. But I want you to understand that falling is a part of learning to walk. What child learns how to stand without falling? When a, a child first pulls themselves up on furniture, and when they are able to stand, they, the first thing that they do, they, they just start standing, and it's, it's a real unstable kind of a stance. They, they start like a, almost like a, a weeble wobble, but they don't fall down. But they, they, they're sort of staggering almost like a drunk person. And then they'll this all of a sudden just collapse and fall to the ground. It's a part of their learning to stand. And until you learn how to stand, you can't learn how to walk. Because until you get stable, don't talk to me about walking. I'm trying to get stable. You can't talk to me about success when I'm in survival mode. I'm trying to breathe. Don't talk to me about moving. I'm trying to get stable. I got to get my head above water because I feel like I'm drowning. I, I need help. I'm just trying to get stable. I'm trying to stand. I'm trying to stand after I've done everything just to stand. I can't walk 
until I first learn to, to stand and I need a grace while I'm standing and falling and standing and falling and standing and falling. I need a grace until I've learned to stand stably and then take a few steps and then fall. It's a part of the learning process of how God teaches us and grows us and develops us. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16 says that the godly may trip seven times or fall seven times, but they will get up again. But no one, but one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. You see, but God helps us that the godly may fall seven times, seven times, but they'll get back up again. We get back up. We fall, but we get back up. Failing is not determined by falling, it's determined by quitting. You don't have to quit where you fail. You don't have to quit wherever you fail. You don't have to quit there. Don't stay there. You don't drown because you fall into the water. You drown because you stay there. And a godly person falls seven times. Well, I thought if you're godly, you'd never fall. What about him who, who keeps us from falling? That's a gerund. That's a perpetual kind of a state of constantly falling. Constantly. But no, it's not to say that you won't make this fall to where you go down and then you get back up again. That's what Proverbs 24, 16 is saying that you may fall, but don't stay there. Get back up. Just get back up. I tell people, I only have two positions. I'm either up or I'm getting up. I'm either up or I'm, I'm getting up. Don't ever get comfortable in a down situation. Don't ever get comfortable. That's not your destination. Please understand this. Failure is not the opposite of su success. It's part of success. Please understand that very clearly. Failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. Don't run from failure. Learn from it. Don't run from failure. Learn from it. Embrace it. Fail forward. It's, it, it gives you an experience. It capacitates you. It further equips you to be able to succeed in the next thing that you're going to do. But failure is not a loss, it's a gain. Why is it a gain? It's because you learn, it's because you change, it's because you evolve, it is because you emerge, it's because you develop, it's because you, 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 you come out of it better. You ask the quintessential question here, why do we fail? Why, why? Why do we fail? I mean, here's the psalmist saying that, that uh, I, I may, my flesh may fail, my heart may fail, but why do we fail? Why do we fail? You ready for this? Because we have to. I know you were looking for something deep and profound. We fail because we have to. We fail because we have to. It's a part of the learning process. It's a part of the process. We fail because we have to. We fail because we have to, not because we're evil. We fail because we have to. Because we have to what? We fail because we have to learn humility. Anybody know some arrogant people just look straight ahead? Who think they know it all and nobody can tell them anything because they know it all? Uh, who acts like they never make a mistake, but yet they're always pointing out what you do wrong. Please keep looking straight ahead. Keep, look, look. I'm doing the talking now. You didn't say that. So, but notice we fail because we, f uh, because we need to learn humility. We need to learn humility. Humility is a road to promotion because God exalts the, the humble. When you bow down, God will lift you up. God will take every valley and raise it up. He exalts the low place. He exalts every valley and brings every mountain and hill low. See, so when you are already arrogant, God's going to, it's just a matter of time before he brings you down. You may be on top today, bawling and this, that, and the other, but somebody's going to have to come and serve you. 
later on when you used to be on top and now you're mumbling to yourself and drooling food and, and saliva down the side of your mouth and somebody is having to change you and bathe you because you're in a downward spiral and that's why you have to be nice to people because you don't ever know where you might find yourself in life. That's why you can't look down in condescension toward other human beings. And you have to love people. And you have to walk humbly with your God. Humbly with your God. And there are some people that if you never ever sin, God wouldn't be able to use you because you wouldn't be able to relate to anybody because you're dishonest with a pharisaical attitude acting as though you have never missed the mark, taken a shot and just missed it. And God is looking for people that will be honest enough to say, I missed it, but God covered me by his grace. His love covered the multitude of my sin. I'm not here because I'm good. I'm here because God is good. I don't have this because I did all of the right things and made all of the right decisions, but God was good in spite of me. He was better to me than what I deserved. Anybody ever have God to be able to bless you with a job and a position and a house or a husband and a wife that you should never have deserved, but God was better to you than what you deserve because he covered you by his grace and his mercy in your life. And even when he blessed you, you were flawed. But he blessed you anyhow. And so we learn, we, we, we fail because we have to learn humility. We fail because we have to learn that we are loved unconditionally. Because we are loved unconditionally. I know a certain pastor friend of mine told me that when his daughter, as a teenager, popped up pregnant, and that news devastated both mother and father, they dropped to the floor, they, they were embarrassed, they were hurt, they were deeply disappointed. But that little teenage daughter came to them and they said, Daddy, I never knew how much you loved me. And I thought you loved me because I did everything right. But she saw a different side of the love. That though she had messed up, made a bad decision, and acted from the impulses of a flesh, they said, you're still our daughter. And we love you, not because you hadn't gotten pregnant out of wedlock. Now that you're pregnant out of wedlock, we still love you. You're still God's gift to us. God still has a destiny for you. And may I tell you that she's in ministry today. Because God saw something in spite of her. I I'm just telling you that sometimes we fail so that we can learn about God's unconditional love, to know that we are loved unconditionally. We also fail because we have to learn wisdom. Wisdom. You get wisdom. Wise people are considered wise because they, they've learned what to do because of their experience. You get experience by making bad decisions. And when you do bad decisions, make bad decisions, you get an experience from that that then equips you to make a good decision, and we call that wisdom. But you get the wisdom after you've only made a bad decision. Wisdom comes out of the experience of doing something that wasn't so smart, and then you learn from it. We fail because we have to learn humility, because we have to learn that we are loved unconditionally, because we learn wisdom, because we learn patience for God's timing. We fail because we have to learn patience for God's timing. It's, it, you can't just do the right thing. You have to do the right thing at the right time. The right thing done at the wrong time is the wrong thing. I mean, a 10-year-old kid who, who says, you know what, uh, I know how to drive, and I'm going to get behind the wheel of a car, and I'm going to drive. But you might be able to drive, and, you know, somebody can teach you, and you can honestly have, be skilled to do it, but it's not the time. It is not the time that you've matured in judgment, because you might become a speed racer daredevil and assume that you're in a video game when you pull up beside somebody in a fast car. 
and you'll make decisions that you don't have the emotional maturity. And sometimes we get bent out of shape with God because God didn't give us what we prayed for and asked for at that time. And then we become manipulative in our flesh and get it. And then it becomes our downfall because God was trying to say, listen, do this in my time. I got this for you, but not now. And whatever you use by manipulation to get in your flesh, you're going to have to use manipulation to keep it. And while you manipulate it to get it, somebody is going to manipulate him out of your arms. Oh, and then you're going to be in a real pickle and be upset that they treated you this way. When God was saying, I had something for you, but I wanted you to learn some things and mature you emotionally and, and allow you to be able to see proper values before you jumped into this thing so that you would know what you were doing. God has a timing, so we fail because we have to learn God's timing. We fail because we have to learn forgiveness. We have to learn forgiveness. I mean, if you never had a problem, you wouldn't know God could solve them. We have to be forgiven. God has given us a song that the angels can't sing. You know why? Angels are created beings. We're not merely created, we were born. And we, we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity and we had to be redeemed. Angels have not been redeemed. They have no testimony about the blood of Jesus. Because they haven't been redeemed out of sin. They were created to serve God. So they never had to be redeemed. We had to be forgiven. And when we're forgiven, it teaches us to forgive others. Father, Jesus taught us to pray. God, help us forgive our trespasses as we forgive others. The way that you need, we need you to forgive us, that's how we need to forgive others. So it teaches us. He allows us to fail so that we need to experience forgiveness so we'll know how to give forgiveness to others. And we fail because we have to learn to be compassionate with others who fail. You have to learn to be compassionate with others who fail. If you never ever failed, you would come down on other people in such a pharisaical, judgmental, legalistic way that you turn other people off because you missed a goody two shoes and missed goody two shoes. And you've never done anything wrong. But it teaches us to be compassionate with other people who fail because we all fail at some point. And then... We fail because we have to learn that our character is tested in order to be strengthened. Our character is tested in order to be strengthened. Because a person is actually defined by how they respond to failure. It's not because you did something bad that God will hold you in a place. David messed up. He had a man killed and then he committed adultery with his wife. And, and yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Because when Nathan the prophet came and confronted him about his sin, David didn't start saying, wait, 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 wait a minute, I'm the king. I, I, I can do what I want to do. He didn't justify it. He didn't say, well, you know, I mean, you know, he got killed out in battle. I, you know, and then, you know, I, I just took his widow. No, no, no. David owned it. And he started crying. He put on sackcloth and ashes. This man was repentant. He pleaded with God. God, wash me with hyssop. Cleanse me. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit. He wanted to get it right. He had missed the mark. And he said, God, have mercy upon me. I need you. He said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Because when I did that that offended you, it messed up my joy relationship with you. And I need you, God. I need you. I want to be restored in that. And because he had enough integrity to own it, he was able to disown it. Until you own your sin, you can't disown it. You got to confess it and say, it's me. You got to say, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. I'm a drug addict. I, I, I'm, I'm addicted to porn. You got to own it before you can disown it. And you, you got to say, Lord, I, I need a redemptive work in grace. Anytime that you're in denial, it is your way of saying, I am rejecting help in this area. I'm rejecting your grace. I'm rejecting your delivering power. You got to own it in order to disown it. And David didn't try to deny it. He owned it. And when he owned it, God was able to then purge him 
of it. So there's a blessing in just being able to own it, just, just to be able to own it. But it, it, he defined his character, that he was a man after God's own heart. He had a, a faithful heart toward God. A man who's a faithful person to God does not mean that they're perfect, but it does mean that they're perfect in their repentance. That every time that they offend God, they go back and get it right. That's what real faithfulness is. We fail because we have to learn to grow. We have to grow. We fail in order to grow. You fail forward. Our failures help us to come back and approach life more intelligently. With a deeper godly conviction. With a greater depth of love and compassion and mercy and understanding. We grow through that. We have to fail so that we can grow. And we fail because we have to be turned from our way to God's way and God's will. We fail so that we can come into, into God's way. Because we're going to try to do things our way because we think that we know better. We think we know everything until God then lets you fall flat on your face. And he lets you see that the way that you had mapped your life out, things are not going to go because the person that you got hooked up with, they didn't follow the script. And now you got to say, Lord... Father, I'll stretch my hands to thee. You're going to be just like Adam, the woman that thou gavest me. And so God is, is trying to say, I'm trying to turn you from your will to my will. From your way to my way. Lord, our thoughts are not your thoughts. Our ways are not your way. God, your ways are far higher than ours. And it's to turn us to God's way of doing things. That's, that's what kingdom is about. It is about the will and the way of God being brought down into the earth as God has it in the heavens. And then we fail because we have to discover that our weaknesses reveal the glory of God's strength. Our weaknesses reveal the glory of God's strength in our lives. Ultimately, our failure, we have to fail because it reveals our need of God. If you never fail, you never need God. If you could do everything successfully, if you could do everything successfully, you'd never have a need for God. That's why when God gives you a vision, that's why when God places a dream in your heart, it is beyond your skill level and your talent level uh, because you have to trust him to help you for it to come into manifestation so that you will know that this is not by might nor by power, but is by his spirit. God wanted to call you to do something bigger than what you could do in your own strength. We need God. We need God. That if you don't have God, even if you think that you're going to be an entrepreneur and start your own business, now you got to submit to some government regulations. And now you got to deal with county officials and they have to grant you permission. You can't just do what you want to do. You're going to need God to say, Lord, I need you to move this legal arm. I'm dealing with a system here. I'm dealing with systemic evil that is working against me. I need you, Jesus. You'll always find a problem in every God assignment. God will never give you a dream or a vision that you can accomplish without his help. He will cause you to fail in your ability to get the will of God done without him. That's why he allows us to fail so that we will ultimately realize we need God. It will call you, cause you to, to look up while you're already down. Some people never look up until they're knocked down. And some people have to lose things before they find the real thing. God has a plan. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he knew, he knew, he knew that we would make uh, errors from the very beginning. That's why the Bible tells about it. Revelations 13, 8. The Bible talks about how the, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. He knew we would mess up. He knew that we would mess up because there's none righteous. That's an unrighteous. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 through 12. Notice this. Well then, are we Jews better than others? No, not at all. For we've already shown that all men alike are sinners. All men alike are sinners, whether Jews or Gentiles. As the scriptures say, no one is good. No one in the world is innocent. No one has ever really followed God's path or even truly wanted to. Everyone has turned away. All have gone wrong. No one anywhere has kept on doing what is right. Not one. 
At some point, they've been off trying to do their own thing. They deviated from the norm, deviated from how they were raised, deviating from what they knew was right. And when we mess up, we just have this great tendency of being able to start making ourselves feel better by comparing ourselves with someone who's worse. And we'll say things like, well, Lord, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. You know what, Lord, at least, at least, Lord, I, at least I was with a woman and so-and-so was with an animal. You take somebody else's perversion. You find somebody that's, that has done something that looks worse than what you've done so that it makes you look better. But you see, our fault is in trying to compare ourselves with other fallible human beings. And we are never called to do that. God never ever condones our comparing ourselves with other human beings. When you do that, comparisons, uh, it, they, they always make other people come up short. It's going to give the person who thinks that they're better a false sense of superiority. And then it brings shame to the other. So it, it's never good for either side. And I want you to just see here what the Bible says about our comparing ourselves to others in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. He says, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell us how important they are. But they are only comparing themselves with each other. Notice that. They are only comparing themselves with each other using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. You don't use yourself as a standard of measurement. The only one that wise people will ever compare themselves to is Jesus Christ. Because he is our standard for righteousness. Jesus is our only standard for righteousness. Not another person. Not another human being. Notice what Romans chapter 3 verse 22 and 24 uh, says. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned. All. All, A-L-L, -L. all means to the exclusion of none. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. A gift means you don't earn it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so please don't be discouraged when you fail because you were not the first and you won't be the last. And please understand that there's absolutely nothing that you do that will ever surprise God. There is absolutely nothing that you do that will ever surprise God. Do you think that the Lord will say, Charlene got pregnant. <gasps> Johnny got somebody pregnant. <gasps> God will never, ever be surprised. He knows us. God, like, I, I, know, I know, I knew she was fast all the while. I knew she was quiet, but I knew she was fast. God already knows. God has no surprises. He's omniscient. For God's sake, he's God. He knows everything and loves us in spite of what he knows about you. How deeply endearing that ought to be to you for God to know every peccadillo in your life. He knows every uh, twisted proclivity that you might have in your flesh and God still says, I love you. I love you. I see your perversions. I see your addictions. I love you. I see your hangups and your hiccups and I love you. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you any more than what he loves you right now and there's nothing that you can do that will cause God to diminish his love for you. God loves you and his love covers the multitude of your sin. Is that a license to sin? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Notice Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Then just, just notice what he said. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, people are saying grace, 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 grace. Are we to continue in sin? Is it? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. By no means. But how can we who died to sin, still live in it. This just really demonstrates our desperate need for God because we fail in our own human attempts to be able to please him. 
You know, Romans 5, 8 says God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us while we were sinners. Not while you, not the moment that you uh, accepted him. No, no, no. He died while we were sinners, while we were still a mess because he saw something in us beyond what we can see. It, it reminds us of God's incredible mercy toward us that God is faithful t- even when we are not. That ought to blow your mind that God is faithful even when we are not. Notice Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Notice what it says. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. They are new every morning. Today when you woke up. God had mercies today because we sin sometimes sins of omission and sins of commission, sins of attitudes, sins of being offended by things, little things and all kind of craziness that happen. God brings new mercies every day for every shortcoming, every time we miss the mark, he's got new mercies every day. That's why every day you ought to find something to say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for putting up with me another day. Thank you for loving me in spite of me, in spite of my attitude, in spite of, you know, my disposition, in spite of my laziness, in spite of my going back on my word, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the mercy that you give me today to be able to live, to clean the slate, God, to give me a brand new chance today. New today, this morning, God, thank you just for your mercy today. Thank you for mercy, for grace that follows me every day of my life. Thank you, Jesus. What a blessing, what a blessing. And I encourage you today to never, ever use your fa- failure or God's mercy as an excuse to stay down. Never use failure or God's mercy as an excuse to stay down. Don't give up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Keep pressing, keep pressing, and always have a goal in front of you to please God. Let there be a goal that you have in your heart to please God. I love uh, Paul's goal, as, as he talked about in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. He knew. Uh, But one thing I do, he said, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward. I'm pressing to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal. Have a goal of pleasing God. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on for the upward call. It's calling me out. God doesn't just call you out. He calls you up. I said, God doesn't just call you out. He calls you up. You're not just supposed to stay on the same level. When the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord in in, in Proverbs, uh, in in Psalms 32. uh, When God begins to talk about that, when God, when God talks about that, Psalm 37, 23. When God says that, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. It's not just one foot in front of the other. Steps are designed for escalation. That it's designed to take you up to another level. You're designed to live on another level. And so God is actually bringing us up. He didn't just bring you out of sin. God is bringing you up in him. There ought to be a goal that lifts you up to another level. You shouldn't be on the same level next year. You ought to start growing up, maturing up, and becoming more than what you were before. You shouldn't be on the same level. What person wants to start in, a, in, a, in an organization and you in the mail room at an entry-level position and 20 years down the road, you still in an entry-level position? You ought to be promoted. You ought to be stepping up, being trusted with more responsibility, giving more money. You ought to be growing. You ought to be developing. You ought to be emerging. You ought to be out of just coming up but coming out. And where you start is not where you should end. That's not what destiny is about. You ought to have a destination that lifts you to a higher level. If you were with this one, when you get in another relationship, don't hang around the same kind of trash. You ought to step up on another level. You ought to get somebody that has different appetites, a different attitude, a different perspective, a different grace, a different mercy. When God brings you out, when God brings you out and His mercy is made new to you, confess up, confess up, and then get up, and then pray up, and then fight up. Because whenever you're on your way up, it's always a fight. It's always a fight. 
It's always a fight. But you got to be able to confess it. You got to be able to confess it. First John 1 9 tells it if we confess our sins, sin can only go out of your mouth by one way, and that's confession. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what God does. And I said, you got to be, you got to be willing not just to confess up and pray up, but also to fight up. You got to fight your way up. You got to fight your way up. You know why? Because oppressors don't just willingly release you from their oppression. You have to fight to lay hold of your freedom. Once you get your freedom, you got to fight to keep it. Because the devil will let you out because he'll say, they'll be back. Oh, he'll let you go after you have had a hit of drugs because I'll put an itch in them next week. You'll be all in church, I'm fired up on Sunday, but by Tuesday night, he said, they'll be back. I got a hook in their flesh. You go out, you're on a leash. And that's why you have to you have to build strength. Resistance builds strength. The more that you yield, the weaker you become. And the more that you resist, the stronger that you become. Notice what Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4 says. In your struggle against sin, there is a struggle. Sin is a struggle. It's a war in your members. There's a war going on. There's a war going on. I know we got mercy. I know we got grace. But there's a war going on on the inside of you. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of the shedding of your blood. He said, you got to resist. You got to resist to the shedding of blood. You got to resist to you're willing willing to die. You got to to resist to you're willing to lose something that is precious to you. In your struggle against sin, yes, it's a struggle to do what's right. I know he's gracious, but that still does not stop that war in your flesh. Your flesh doesn't always want to get up and pray. Your flesh doesn't want to read the Bible. Your flesh doesn't want to fast. Your flesh doesn't want to speak to people that's been nasty to you. There's a whole lot that your flesh, you have to, have, you have to ask. You look up toward God and say, Lord, give me strength. Give me strength. Give me strength. When somebody says something crazy to you, you have to say, Lord, give me strength. Though my flesh may fail and my heart may fail, but God. He is the strength of my life. He is my strength. He's my redeemer. I need the strength of God because I'm in a fight. I'm in a fight against something in my flesh that wants me to do the opposite of what God wants me to do. We're in a fight. Who are we kidding? You don't get your flesh sanctified. Your flesh doesn't get saved. Your flesh still loves flesh. Your flesh loves carnality. Your flesh loves lust. Your, your flesh loves pornography. It loves inebriation. It loves drugs and alcohol. It loves licentiality. Your flesh wants that. It wants to pull you into gossip. It wants to pull you into backbiting. It wants to pull you into jealousy and envy. War with your flesh. What? No, you don't, devil. Sit down. Sit down here. In Jesus' name, you got to be able to say, I am resisting. I'm resisting. I'm pressing against it. I'm pressing against it. I'm pressing against it because he's always trying to take you back to what God delivered you out of. I'm just telling you, it's not what you go to that messes you up. It's what you go back to. I declare to you in the name of Jesus, you got a war. You got a war. You know what's back there. Determine yourself. I'm not going back. He always shows you the pleasure in the sin, but he never shows you the pain. He never shows you the consequence. He wants you to come back to the pleasure, back to the memory of what was good to you, but he doesn't show you the consequence, the guilt, the shame, the insecurity, the embarrassment, the debt. He does not show you what is destroying your life. Fight, fight, fight to the shedding of blood. Resist, push back. The more you resist, the stronger you get. The more you resist, the stronger you get. Every time you say no, God strengthens something in you.
And this is why when God has graced you and he's forgiven you, it's not merely just saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. It means that we bring to God fruit of repentance. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8 says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. When you bear fruit, fruit, fruit is something that you do. Fruit is empirical evidence. It is empirical data that can be observed, that can be measured in some way. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. And when we fail, why we fail? It's because we have to. Because we have to. Why did I have to mess up? Because you had to. But you don't have to keep on just staying in the place wallowing down in it. I mean, I know you fell and got your clothes dirty. But it's crazy as I don't know what to still be in a clean, in, in, in what was a new dress. And now just because you got it dirty and you still walling around there, somebody sees you a month later and you still walling around there talking about I fell in the mud and I got my clothes all dirty. Yeah, it wasn't your fault that you fell there, but it's certainly your fault if you're still there a month later. Six months later, that happened to you two years and you still walling around in this same kind of mess that you fell into back then that was just one night and you still wallowing don't stay there some failures come as a result of impulse some failures they come as a result of impulse it's just impulse they they, they show you this and this happens it's an impulse it's like a reflex they hit you and pow before you can even think about it a reflex an impulse happens without thinking some failures are the result of impulse. Some of them are a result of spiritual immaturity. You're just young and you're just spiritually immature. Some of them are just a result of foolish decisions. And then we want to blame the devil, but it was just a foolish decision. Just, just, just own it. Because if you don't own it, remember you can't disown it. Some are the results of ungodly influences. Just because you never would have done it had you not had somebody edging you on. I mean, there's something, I mean, I've been into that environment and I've seen them turn up a, a jug or something and the folks are just, just a chug, 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 jing, 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 and the, the whole, if they were not in that atmosphere where somebody was edging them on, they never would have done it. It's just ungodly influences. And then some of it, some failures are the result of fear, just fear. And it reminds me of the apostle Peter. The apostle Peter, you remember when they, they came and they arrested Jesus and then they looked at Peter. They said, hey, aren't you one of them? And Peter denied him. I mean, I told him three times. He said, no, no, I don't know him. Then the Bible said that he swore. He started cussing him. You know, some of you all know that the vocabulary. I, I don't, you know, I'm not fluent in profanity. But many of you know. Many of you know Peter cussed. And said, I don't know him. I done told you I don't know him. Peter, Peter let him have it. Peter was saved, but he, wasn't, he hadn't been saved that long. <laughs> and he cussed and said, I don't know him. But Peter, he didn't do that out of a desire to sin. He did it as an impulse. And he did it out of his spiritual immaturity and he did it perhaps most importantly out of fear of his own life being taken and so he denied because he was afraid of what would happen to him and so sometimes our failures can come as a result of various things in our life but after that he denied Jesus to show that Peter was really saved Peter cried like a baby. The Bible says that he wept bitterly. Luke chapter 22, verse 62. He wept bitterly. He was so regretful over what had happened. And that regret led him to a repentance and it restored his relationship. Because good grief can be used as a tool, and an instrument in the hand of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 explains that. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So you see that God has a way. God has a way. In fact, the Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Because some things that you'll go through, you will suffer. 
You know, whenever you're on the wrong track, you have to thank God that God will use whatever is necessary in order to get you out of that rut and on the right track. Always be grateful to God for whatever he uses to turn your life from evil and destruction back on the right road. Whatever it is, it may be uncomfortable, it may be embarrassing, and you may lose something that is precious to you, but thank God for whatever he uses in order to redeem your soul. Thank God for that. When Jesus got ready to wash Peter's feet as a demonstration of servanthood that we are called to in leadership, Peter said, no, 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 Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus replied to him in John chapter 13 and verse 7, he says, you don't understand what I'm doing, but someday you will. And that's what happens to us many times. We're in a place in our life and God is doing stuff that we don't understand. And what do you do? What in the world do you do when God is doing something in your life that you don't understand? He doesn't need to wait until you have full understanding before he goes ahead with his plan. That's when he says, trust me, trust me, trust me. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I'm headed east and I'm hitchhiking and Jesus stops and picks me up and starts taking me west, I don't know where he's taking me, but I trust him. And when you trust him, who is the way? You don't have to understand where you're going. I trust the one who's leading me. I trust the voice that's calling me because God says that my sheep hear my, my voice and a stranger they will not follow. They trust his voice. If you ever hear your daddy's voice and you trust his character, you don't have to understand everything. And sometimes you're in an emergency situation and the Lord doesn't have time to explain it to you. He just has to say, duck. Turn off. Get out. You never know what God is doing. I believe in marriage with all of my heart, but one day the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said to tell this woman, get out of your marriage and do it immediately. And I, I'd never had a word like that. It seemed contrary to scripture to me. But I went trusting and trembling. I said, Lord, I know, I know this was your voice. I didn't tell this to myself. Why would I do that? And little did I know that as soon as she obeyed that word of the Lord, her husband was arrested for armed robbery of a bank, sent to prison for 25 years. She would have been an accomplice to this but God rescued her out he doesn't always have time to explain to you he says you may not understand this now but later on you will someday you will and some things right now you don't understand why you have to struggle why am I going through this Lord Lord why am I still by myself you don't know what a blessing it is to be by yourself until you're in an abusive relationship you don't know what a blessing it is that God may be protecting you from until all hell breaks loose in your life. You don't understand. And so he's just telling you there's something that you don't understand right now, but someday you will. You have to trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him with all of your heart. In all your ways you acknowledge him and God will direct you. God will lead you. He'll help you to understand. I'm so grateful because if King David had never failed, there would be so many of the Psalms that we would never have. So that when we fail, we've got to have somebody that we can relate to who has failed and experienced God's redemptive grace in their life. This is one of the scriptures that David wrote when he was broken. Psalm 119 in verse 71. The punishment you brought me through was the best thing that could have happened to me. For it taught me your ways. God knows how to whip you and love you all at the same time. Doing it for your good. And that's why them old mamas back in the day that wouldn't, they're not going to stand you in a corner and counsel you. They, they beat the daylights out of you and they say, baby, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Anybody have that kind of mama that would send you out in the, 
the backyard to get some switches and they braid them together. They make you go get their own instrument of torment. Go down and get my belt. Go down and get me some switches, some branches out there. And, and, and they beat, they, they said, this is going to hurt me. You don't, you don't understand that until later on. And when they didn't understand how to cast the devil out, they were trying to beat it out. But the punishment that they brought us through, he said, it was the best thing that could have happened to me for it taught me your ways. And I'm telling you, when mamas were doing that back in the day, and daddies, if you had a crazy daddy, they weren't having to come up to the school and go down to the jailhouse and visit you. Because they averted some of that stuff because they, they applied the board of education to the seat of learning early. And we were afraid that, that they were being hurt, and I'm not trying to advocate for child abuse. I'm not talking about folks with uncontrolled uh, anger. Because discipline, hear me, discipline is correction in love. Not out of frustration, not out of anger. It is saying in, in a very sober way, what you're doing is unacceptable. And if you stay on this road, it's going to derail your life. And I'm trying to save your life right now. And I want to give you an experience here that lets you know that you don't do this. And you're just highlighting something because you love them. To be able to correct them and lead them in a way. And they may not understand it right now. But someday... You'll look back and you'll thank God for every spanking that you got. And many of you would have said, you know what? There was some other sneaky thing that they never found out about. But I'm glad for the spankings that I did get because I wouldn't be half the person that I am today had they not corrected me when I was wrong because they would have sent the wrong message into my life. But I'm grateful that David was able to understand that. The Apostle Paul talked about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. But he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you. And my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses. For when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. Let me remind you of this. Never ever stop telling yourself that his strength is made perfect in my weakness. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. And even when God is disciplining you, understand that he only does that out of love. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Thank God that he helps us to do what is right that we could never do without him. The old folks used to say when they would get up to testi testify, Lord, I thank you that when I woke up this morning that I had a, I had a mind to serve you. And some of them would say that I had a, a do right mind. You don't give that to yourself. God really gives it to you. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 confirms it. It says, for God is working in you giving you the desire, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You got the power whether you use it or not. You got the power to do what pleases him. He, he gives you the desire. There's some people that don't even have a desire to serve God. You're blessed if you have a desire to want to do right, even when you come up short. You're blessed to have the desire to do what's right and the power to do what pleases him. God is, God is with you. I want to just encourage you that to help you to minimize your failures, stay grounded in God's Word. Stay grounded in God's Word. Stay surrounded by God's people and stay surrendered to God's Spirit. Stay grounded in the Word of God. Ground yourself in His Word. Stay surrounded by God's people so you'll be in the right influence. You've got to always have a supportive tribe. So that if you get in a difficult place, somebody can edge you on. To say, come on, come on, baby. To be a part of that great cloud of witnesses, surrounded by God's people. Surrendered to God's Spirit. That's why he calls us to be a part of a church. You don't mature in a silo. 
You mature in community, in family. That's why God takes single people and puts them in families, grounded in God's Word, surrounded by God's people, surrendered to God's Spirit. If you really want to be able to do your best in terms of walking upright before God, grounded by His words, surrounded by His people, surrendered to His Spirit. So that even if the person is not there, if I'm surrendered to God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak to me and say, there's a, there's a need here. I want you to bless this person. Here's someone that needs prayer. I want you to pray for them. Here's someone that needs a word of encouragement. Text so-and-so right now. Send them a message. Surrender to His Spirit. How surrendered are you to the Spirit of God? Sometimes your sin is not based on what you do. It's what you fail to do that the Holy Spirit has prompted you to do. To him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not. To him, to her, it is sin. So sometimes our sin is not just what we do. It's what we fail to do. But when you are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, you realize not my will, but your will be done. God, have your way in my life. So that when I miss the mark, God, I want to please you. I want to please you. I want to please you. And Lord, I thank you for even having a, a mind to want to do what's right. And even though things seem unfair in the world, God, and other folks who don't even serve you and look like they get blessed. But there is a reward in the fruit of righteousness in your own spirit and peace of mind. And when you lay your head down at nighttime, that there is a peace that comes from just doing what you know was right to do because it is right but we fail because we have to don't beat yourself up over your failures but our failures sometimes land us in the water nobody drowns because they fall into the water they only drown because they stay there the good news of the gospel of Jesus is that you don't have to stay in the water you can rise up out of that Make a decision to say, I'm coming out. He's thrown a life raft out to you, and we grab hold on it, and he pulls us out. He pulls us out. He pulls us out. And he's calling us. In China, they have a law that it is against the law to rescue a drowning person. They have so many people that they devalue human life to that level that it is illegal in China to rescue a drowning person because they've got a billion and a half other folks and if they catch you rescuing someone who's drowning you pay a penalty but the Lord is looking for those who are ready to be rescued and who are crying out for help bow your heads if you're in this place. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.